Hudu, the Akan term Undu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life. Undu, to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession, spirit communication, divination. Cast, the Akan term Guasi, to project, to throw, release. Cast, to form into a mold, to solidify. Who do cast to project our sacred mold of Akan ancestral religion in North America, the solidification of our identity, our ritual culture of medicine for healing and defense, our ritual culture of spirit communication for knowledge and application. Who do cast for the preservation of our people and the eradication of our enemies. Greetings, Afro-Rakani, Afro-Rakani people, African Black people. This is our first official Hoodoo Cast podcast for authentic Hoodoo, our kind of ancestral religion in North America. We did do our first unofficial podcast when we had our Echi Sign conference and we traveled to New Orleans with Voodoo Queen Galinda Laveau and myself. So this is our first official podcast. We are in Philadelphia. We came to Philadelphia to connect with our special guests. I am Ojirafo Kwesi Rodney Ta Akan, Ojirafo of Akwanguman and Marokati Kimuli Akwangu Nation in North America within Ojiraman, purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. And today we have a special guest, Dr. Katrina Hazard. Um, Dr. Katrina Hazard has published many articles, um, very important books, and the book we want to talk about today is. Mojo working the old African American hoodoo system. So, I first um, saw the book about ten years ago, and when I saw the book, there are many books that are written about hoodoo, different articles and so forth, people speaking, documentaries and so forth. A great deal of misinformation. So when I saw she was talking about the old black belt Southern hoodoo tradition, and talking about how hoodoo began as a full-fledged ancestral religious practice and so forth, and then the how things unfolded over the past hundred plus years, and how things migrated to urban areas and things shifted and so forth, I understood how important the work is. So, um, well first, appreciate you for coming out. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> and I'll say, uh, in fact, Dr. Hazard came to our first Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival that we hold every year in Washington, D.C., so we really appreciate that. So, the mojo working, the old African-American hoodoo system. So, what prompted you to publish that work? Well, um, be before I answer that, I would just like to, to say how much I appreciate your work oh, okay, nice. and how important I think your work is and that. how much it makes me rethink the work that I do. So, I want to thank you for your work before that. I answer that. Okay. Nice. Well, what prompted me to write it, there were a number of reasons, but one reason that I wrote it was to attempt to clarify some of the errors I saw, especially online, um, especially by people that I call marketeers in the book, um, who were just fabricating uh, implements and fabricating ideas and fabricating histories and literally draining our community of resources and draining our community of money. And so I decided to do some research and write about this thing. Um, one of the subtextual concerns I had was this belief that we have not created culture here in North America. Um, and that seems to underline a lot of the approach in the literature, not only with hoodoo, but with respect to everything culturally we've produced. Um, why we have to go to the Caribbean to study something in the Deep South is beyond me. But even our prominent dance researchers um, have done that um, to make an argument for our tradition based on the evidence of somebody else's tradition. Um, so I wanted to demonstrate that there was indeed a system um, and that those things that we were seeing today were merely fragments of what remained of that system. And so I wanted to attempt to go back and try to look at this thing systematically and to look at it as if it were a whole religion 
in the same way that people look at Yoruba or Khan or um, the Congolese religion. And I asked myself a series of questions. One was, like, why would we be any different? We share bloodline with those people. We come from the same ethnic groups as those people. Why would we do anything any different? Um, the other problem that I had is that many of the researchers that talk about hoodoo would use the ethnicity of the oppressor to explain our traditions. So they would use the dichotomy, the, the most familiar dichotomy is whether or not um, people were enslaved by Spanish speakers or French speakers versus those who spoke English. Um, and so I saw no need to use the oppressor's ethnicity and his ethnic traditions to explain what we had been doing and what we had developed. And so all of that kind of compounded itself. And the next thing I knew was I was writing this book. Now, hoodoo is not my area of study. My area of study was dance. And I had been looking at the ring and shop. And you wrote the, the book, The Juking. Right, book. the book Juking. But I'd been looking at the ring shop a little more extensively. Mm -hmm. And I started asking a series of questions about this ring shop, especially after I read the work of Bishop Payne, one of the founders of the AME Church. And the piece that I specifically read that motivated me was um, he was conducting conversion ceremonies um, right after Reconstruction. And he was in the South, and he was, getting, he was holding big tent meetings. And people were, big, were getting saved. And one of his young ministers said to him, you have to let people make that circle. You have to allow them to do this ring shot because Alexander Payne was hardcore against it. Okay. You know, he saw it as sort of a, a remaining a pagan ritual, right. something that was related to spookism. And of course, he probably didn't have an in-depth understanding of African traditional religion. Exactly. Um, and so I decided to try to address it, um, learn from it, perhaps correct it, um, and just add some more details to explain what people were doing. And the fact that people who were converted would not accept Jesus if they could not do the ring shout raised a series of questions in my mind. Okay. The first question was, if they wanted to bring the ring shout into their Christian conversion experience, what were they bringing it out of? Exactly. So I thought, well, they have to be bringing it out of some context in order for it to be sustained for at least 250 years. It couldn't just be out there floating around. And all the dance researchers and researchers on Hulu that I had read never attempted to contextualize the ring shout. And so as I asked a series of questions, like a six-year-old child, or the question of, well, mommy, if they wanted to bring it into their conversion, what were they bringing it out of? That's a very simple question. That's a question that a child might answer. And they would typically characterize it as Af Afro-American folk dancing. Exactly. Okay. And they saw it as a dance, a purely a dance, mm -hmm. in the same way that you see the Charleston or the Slop or something as a dance. Right. But it had to be more than that if they wanted to bring it into their Christian conversion. And they had sustained this form for at least 250 years that we can count. So the question of what were they bringing it out of? Well, as I looked at the counterclockwise sacred circle dances in the Caribbean and everything else, they were all located inside of an African religious tradition. Um, in the yoga tradition, the counterclockwise sacred dirt dance, sacred circle is the dance of Yamanya. And you know, they pull up their skirts and they go counterclockwise. But all the Africans had a counterclockwise sacred circle dance, and so did we. So there had to have been a context. And the spirit said it to me, it said that context is what people are called hoodoo. That hoodoo had to have been a full fledged religion for us at some point. It may have been short lived, but it existed as a full fledged religion between the time we were kidnapped and the time we become fully converted to Christianity. Well, what went on in the meantime? Something had to be going on. People were not just, you know, kind of floating around, picking cotton and cutting cane. Exactly. They had to be doing something. They believed in a higher power. They had to 
be plain, especially when released from slavery. Exactly. And so I came to the conclusion, in fact, I didn't come to the conclusion, it was sent to me. Mm -hmm. um, literally, it was given to me. It was, just, it was handed to me because I couldn't write without it. It, it. I had to wait for the spirit to literally download, just like you download something from a computer. Um, and it said to me that this dance had a religious context, and that religious context was the old, old do religion, get on it. Absolutely. And I got on it. And that's, you know, that's what drew me, because 10 years ago, you released the book. I think I, I saw it in like the spring, you know, 10 years ago. But just a few months before that, I didn't know anything about the book, but I had written the article, the first definitive article for, for us, you know, from my organization on the icon origin of the term hoodoo. Because prior to that, I hadn't written anything on hoodoo. But I, I mentioned before, you had you know, some practice talking about hoodoo came from the Irish, <laughs> the Irish term hoodoo, talking about collections of stones, or they're trying to say it came from Judeo, the right. so called Jews, and so forth. or they were just manufacturing, or voodoo was just a mispronunciation of voodoo. And my ancestral ancestors is an ancestor for like, you need to write this article, and I started writing it just because I was provoked, as we talked about yeah. earlier. <laughs> and that evening I started writing, and the next thing you know, the sun was rising because I was still in front of the computer. Didn't eat, didn't move, I was just <laughs> putting that out because it was so offensive and insane, the kind of things they were putting forward. So, a few months later, I come in contact with your book, and you're the first one saying, all these other scholars are saying it's Afro-American folk tradition, magical botanical arts, an amalgamation of European and Native American, a little sprinkling of African traditions. <laughs> and you came out and said, no, it was a religion. It's a traditional religious practice before the corruptions came in. And I was like, okay, this, this is it. So now you mentioned, I want to read something from the book, the, the list that you have. So, Those eight, right. like that African religion complex, yes. and all of that was given to me. Now, so the so for the people to see, to page 51 of the book, well, 51 going to 52. So you talk about the African religion complex, and it's eight different elements, and you were able to contextualize what is taking place in the Hoodoo tradition within these eight elements, showing and proving that this is an ancestral religious practice just like everybody. We, did, we didn't sit around in North America waiting for everybody else <laughs> in the islands of South America and everyone else to do something, and we didn't do anything for 300 years. So, uh, one of them is counterclockwise, sacred circle dancing. Number two, spirit possession. Number three, the principle of sacrifice. Four, ritual water immersion. Five is divination, six, ancestor reverence, seven, belief in spiritual cause of malady, and eight, herbal and naturopathic medicine, and you call that the African religion complex with which Hoodoo operates within that, that framework. So, so you said it was given to you, so how did that come about? Well, one of the things I, I was trying to do is to address some of the questions, and one question that appears in the literature is this question of syncretism, mm -hmm. especially when we look at the Caribbean. And um, there are lots of people that have written about this, this syncretic meshing of African tradition with Catholic saints. Right. And because they were very similar, they had similar qualities. Um, so I said to myself, I started asking these questions, well, we didn't have because we were enslaved by Protestants, right. they didn't have a pantheon of saints for us to syncretize any remaining tradition that we had in order to disguise it. So I said, well, what did we do instead? That's what was given to me. That we, instead of moving a step forward, instead of moving it into the Catholic saints, we moved it back into the original elements, mm -hmm. which those or Risha, or divinities represented like the wind, the water, the lightning. And we have Orisha and deity that represent all of them. Mm. Oh yeah, the wind, you know, Shango, the lightning. And so I said, well, why, would, why couldn't we move it backwards? Who says that we have to move it into something external to us? Right. Why couldn't we simply take it back to the original elements? Mm -hmm. Since we were being purged of those intermediary forces. 
but nobody purged us from understanding water right. or wind. And then I began to find who do practices that spoke to each and every one of those exactly. things in the African religion complex. The use of the axe to cut the wind right. to stop a storm. And just all kinds of other things pouring down the moon. And, oh my goodness, just spitting on the broom if someone sweeps your feet. Um, just a whole series of practices that remain in Hoodoo today that I was able to correlate with those original elements that the Orisha or the divinities, the African divinities, represent. So we lost the divinities, but we did not lose the elements that the divinities are drawn from. And so that's what gave me the idea about the African religion complex. So it's like, and I'm going to go out to say, the only thing that we lost, everything else is, you know, maintained. We lost the fluency in the language, like we're not speaking, you know, <laughs> tree or stuff like that in North America fluently. But everything else, if we didn't know that we didn't know the name of a divinity or how to speak that, we would just say the hoodoo spirit of the ocean, the hoodoo exactly. spirit of the moon, the hoodoo exactly. spirit of the river. Exactly, exactly. And eventually if they possessed and said their name, we'll remember the name. But if they didn't, still the hoodoo spirit of the you know. Exactly. But that that I'm reading that African religious complex piece that for people who didn't, you know, for all these years have been writing about voodoo is just a mispronunciation of voodoo, they were forced to reassess yes. and see this is within the overall African ancestral religious complex. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that, that voodoo was simply a mispronunciation of voodoo. Je Jelly Roll Morton, they quote him as saying, well, some people call it, you know, <laughs> voodoo, but we call it and some because he said that some people say oh that's that's what it is mm -hmm. and since they just sound familiar you know that's um it, it's nonsensical but people involved in the real tradition they know it had to be more so well this is all part of that that wider belief that we didn't produce anything mm -hmm. this is all, all underpinned by that that you know we had no culture i've even seen Black people say that. Or prominent black people online yes. say things like that. Like, Where have you been? Right. Well, maybe you don't have a culture. Maybe you know. Maybe your parents didn't do certain things. Right. But it's evident in our, our food preparation style. I went to an heirloom dinner on Sunday, and people were serving the old traditional foods from the deep south. Mm -hmm. And every one of those things has something a collateral somewhere in West Africa, the collard greens cooked in the style of the calabash leaf. Uh, just on and on and on throughout the, the, the whole cake. Uh, you know, there are equivalents of that all over the New World out of Africa. Uh, and just other things, the way we use black eyed peas. Uh, not only as a food, but as a sacred amulet and as a cleansing mechanism as well. And why is it that you have to eat black eyed peas on New Year's. Like, where does that come from? I've even seen people say, well, I couldn't eat any, but I had three in my pocket. Right. You know, why? Where, where do you think that came from? So I started looking at all those so called superstitions that we practiced and continue to practice, and I saw them as part of a, a wider system. This wider system that was derived from the traditional religion that we brought with us when we got here. Yeah, so that's kind of how it worked itself out for me. Yeah. So now, you talk about in the book how certain writers, like you mentioned earlier, would try to cast the differences in expression because some people were enslaved by Spanish-speaking people, some people were enslaved by, you know, English-speaking people, even though that, there are certain things that you can, you can see certain differences, mm -hmm. but you talk about a trichotomy, you talk about the differences between ethnicity, and also importantly, when we were forced to different regions and the labor change, what was the transition? So we we come into the, you know, we're forced into North America. We have our ancestral religious practices intact. If Yoruba people were over here, we talk about the term Jew is a Yoruba term, it means to cast your throw, and juju is the most popular expression of the Yoruba tradition in North America. So they said, I'm a juju man, I'm a juju woman. Originally they were saying I'm a Yoruba man, I'm a Yoruba woman. They were identifying their ethnicity by saying, I'm a Juju man. They're like, oh, that's a Yoruba person. If an Akan person said, I'm a 
who the man, who the woman, they were saying, I'm Akan or Kanche man, Kanche woman. Mm -hmm. Or somebody said, I'm a Wanga man or a Wanga woman. They were saying, oh, he's Obambo because Obambo, Wanga is an Obambo term. We maintain our ethnicity in that practice. So we had traditional practices. We were here, we get dropped off from the boats. We're still speaking our language. We're still practicing traditional religion. We start getting scattered. They take some of them, take our children and send them somewhere else. So they grow up not speaking the language, but we still have ritual practices even though we're not fluent. But then over the next century or so, we start being sent to different places and forced away from the South sometimes and working in distilleries or blacksmithing, different, different things. So the labor begins to change. How does that affect the expression of the ancestral? I wanted to address that also. Um, I've read that lots of times that there was a difference between those people enslaved by Protestants and those enslaved by Catholics, and there were. Mm -hmm. But that is not the way to explain our tradition. Right. And why would we look at the ethnicity of our oppressor to explain our internal traditions? Right. And so I decided, well, if you don't look at the ethnicity of the oppressor, then what do we look at? Well, what were people doing in their daily lives? Mm -hmm. They were engaging in labor. Right. And so as I looked at the, the old Black Belt South, it dawned on me that there were at least three distinct regions, at least three. Um, that are distinguished not only based on type of labor engaged in and the crops that are grown, but the dominant ethnic majority that get deposited in that area. Okay. And so in Louisiana, for example, we know that there were lots of Bambara, and there were lots of Bambara influences. Now, they were not the only group, but they were a dominant group that had an impact on the culture that's recorded in records, and we can find those things. So those people, being Bambara, were engaged in sugarcane. So they are very different than the people in, say, North Carolina, who are probably, a, a significant percentage of them are a Khan slash Ashante a Khan, but they're engaged in growing tobacco. Mm -hmm. So the vocabulary of work would be different. The work schedule would be different. The labor routine would be different. The material culture would be different. You don't work with the same implements and tools in tobacco as you do in sugarcane. In sugarcane, you have a machete. You don't have a machete in tobacco. And so right below that area, the area where tobacco and the Ashanti Akan people are, are a dominant strain, right below that is the, the second area. And we know that those people came from a number of places. One place is the Congo, um, and because we know for sure that a shipload of 720 Congolese warriors who were from the old Congo Wars get picked up and taken and deposited in Charleston, South Carolina in 1720. Okay. And those are the warriors that lead the Stono Rebellion. Okay. okay? And of course, they are the warriors that are from the forces of Kempalita, mm -hmm. the woman who is known as the Congolese Saint Anthony. Um, she was a lesser member of the royal family, and she wanted to reunite, because the, the, the kingdom had divided, and she wanted to reunite the old Congo kingdom. And so, at one point in her life, when she's maybe about 17 years old, or maybe even a little earlier, she appears to die. She falls into maybe a catatonic attack, and, and everybody thinks she's dead. And um, her body's there for a week. And after a week, she opens her eyes and appears to come back to life. And when she comes back to life, she says that she is Saint Anthony of Padua. Okay. This is the most revered saint in all of Catholicism at the time. Um, and remember that there was a Congolese Catholic Church established there in 1490, mm -hmm. uh, 1488, because the first nobleman converts in 1490. And then in 1492, the king of the old Congo kingdom converts to Catholicism. Wow. Yeah, and so there's no colonial pressure. The slave trade hasn't started. Mm -hmm. They do it to solidify trade relations with the Portuguese, because that's what people did back then. You want to solidify trade relations with a company or with a country? I'll marry my son to your daughter, uh -huh. uh, or I'll adopt your religion, or some such thing. Right. Draw 
I'm going to align somehow. So on a cosmetic level, yeah. amongst the readers. And so these people are growing wise, indigo, much later after 1807, cotton. Mm -hmm. Of course, after 1807, that, that, that trichotomy is, is wiped away because everybody is growing cotton now. And so there's a synthesis across the South that homogenizes us, plus the ring shout. And Sterling Stuckey is the one that says this. He says that the ring shout was important as an inter-ethnic assimilation vehicle among the Africans themselves. Because when they got off the boat, even though they might not speak the language of the people that are already there, they recognize that counterclockwise sacred circle. They say, oh, we got one of those back home. Mm -hmm. I can do that. And they fall into that circle. And that becomes the vehicle for the inter-ethnic assimilation among the Africans. That's what makes us one people. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, I'm not sitting here today saying I'm a Yoruba and you're a Congo. Mm -hmm. We're saying that we're, you know, Americans, we're Negro, Black, African Americans. That's what we're, we're calling ourselves the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we see ourselves as members of the same ethnic group. And he says that the Renshaw was instrumental in fostering that among us. So um, when I started working on this hoodoo thing, I looked at that Renshaw. And it was given to me that it was the sacred dance of the old hoodoo religion. Because all of those traditional religions have their sacred dance. Why wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. So what would it be? Wouldn't it be the Charleston? <laughs> right. Wouldn't it be the mashed right. potatoes, you know? What could it have been? Huh? The ring shot. The counterclockwise sacred circle. There it is, right in front of my face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that's interesting because um, the first time I attend, like I, I attended Bembe's in the Yoruba tradition, whether it was, you know, traditional or, you know, uh, from people who've been initiated in Nigeria or people who were practicing the Bakuni tradition and so forth. So, you know, you would see the Bata drummers, the ensemble, and, you know, the Olorisha be possessed and so forth at some point, people doing ritual dances for, you know, the different Orisha. The first time I went to an Akon, an Akon tradition, and Akon is the Akon term, and Komu means to go within. So Komu means to go and move is within. So akomu or kom means to go within the spirit possession. So and they have the spirit possession dance. But the, in the Akon tradition, I noticed the Akon, which is similar to the Bembe, they have the Ocherima, they have the drummers. You know, the Okomfo or Abosunko comes out, they become possessed by the divinities. But the whole ritual practice is dancing in a counterclockwise circle. That's, they come out, even when they're possessed, they dance in a counterclockwise circle. They do that same stutter step <laughs> that we do um, in the ring shot and so forth. And even looking at videos of, you know, you can find old videos from the 50s and 60s when they were doing documentaries in Ghana and so forth. And they'll say the natives are dancing. But when they get possessed, they start moving in that counterclockwise oh. circle. And, you know, the people will move in the counterclockwise oh. circle. So when I saw <laughs> yours and you focused on the ring shot, again, people would not they wouldn't properly contextualize it until you put that out and said this is a sacred, ancestral, ritual, religious, you know, practice. You know, most of the researchers refused to acknowledge that we even had a religion, right. that we could even sustain a religion or anything even resembling a religion. And as I said, what underpins all of that is this notion that we didn't create anything, that we were robbed of everything, and it's right. just not accurate. Now, and in fact, what, what leads to that, so you talked about how the, the labor shifted, the, some of the ritual practices, well, the language, of course, you know, subsides, but we still have this proper notion of, we don't know the specific names, but we can still become possessed by the divinities when we mm -hmm. go to the water, stand up under the sun, the moon, earth mother divinities, and so forth. But then you talk about what took place between emancipation and World War One, when things started really shifting. So what, what happened with the Hulu tradition when it started shifting from that period? Well, a number of things happen. What happens among outsiders is they start selling us our tradition back to us. Mm -hmm. um, they're not as popular early on as they later on become. And in fact, they're probably not as popular among our people. I'm going to say prior to World War II. Okay. Um, 
and that increases as time passes. We lose more and we become more dependent on outsiders. Uh, but not as dependent as we are today because we still had a core of conjurers. And in fact, in Du Bois's Philadelphia Negro, well, he, ha he has a list of occupations mm -hmm. in the black community. And he has conjurer listed, and he talks to five different conjurers. Okay. And he said, yeah, which okay. like blew me away. It's like, okay. Mm -hmm. So these people literally said, I'm a conjurer. Professional is not professional. Exactly. Yeah, they didn't right. say, they didn't attempt to hide it. Mm -hmm. They didn't attempt to disguise it, right. which says something to me, which says that it was a widely accepted tradition. Right. Because exactly. they didn't feel like they had to hide it from him. Mm -hmm. I mean, why wouldn't they say, well, you know, I, I, um, I, I you know, plant crops for a living, or I work on the docks. Or, they literally said, I'm a conjurer. And that's mm -hmm. the term they used. Right. So it was definitely here. Um, we do get scattered, but there, there, there is a core of people that come out of enslavement that are conjurers, that are root doctors that are our, I call them our priests, because mm -hmm. that's what they were. Right. And um, in there I say that they were a, a semiotic signpost for hope. Okay. Because you could always go to the conjurer for a solution. And, and in fact, people would, and of course, the best example of this is in Daughters of the Dust, mm -hmm. where um, Nana Passant takes both the Bible and the conjure bag. Mm -hmm. And she puts the conjure bag on top of the Bible, and she calls it the ancestors. And she said, the Bible and the ancestors. Mm -hmm. So we accepted that. And in fact, we would look at the Old Testament and literally convert it in our minds to a hoodoo document. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're but it originally was not biblical. Right. Exactly. Even though there are people that will right. tell you that it was. Right. I've exactly. seen people who, if, you know, if we were, <laughs> some people say, well, you know, I've seen people say you can't practice hoodoo without the Bible. Now, clearly, we weren't, <laughs> you know, we practiced in the tradition for thousands of years. Even when we get over here, it was against the law to read. So we weren't practicing hoodoo the whole time until they let us read in the 1900s. So, you know, but, <laughs> so, but they'll say it like in a declarative statement. But we do, of course, we're going to look for anything that looks familiar and say, okay, this is similar. And of course, when we look back, we published the Kuku Tum Tum, in fact, 21 years ago was when we first published that. When we showed the deities from ancient Kemet, they stole ritual, you know, titles, sacred titles of different divinities and their functions, and manufactured the characters like Moses and Jesus and eventually Muhammad and Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, all of that. So we show how they, Europeans invaded, the Greeks, the Romans, Arabs, Learn about ancestral religion, start making white statues of black divinities. Black people. Right. And start adding, you know, corrupted titles and trying to make us worship them. And then because of that, some of those elements of ancient texts from ancient Kemet end up in a fragmentary form in the Bible and Quran. And then hundreds of years later when we get introduced to these things, we see something there, even though we know they forced this false religion on us. But we notice there's something in there. But then we can't just jump in and say, you know, there's no hoodoo without the Bible. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been told that uh, by a so-called hoodoo worker, mm -hmm. uh, who I knew was white when I talked to her on the phone, but the ones that uh, the ones that I interviewed and talked to, the few that would talk to me once they found out what I was doing, <laughs> um, all of them had black front men, black front people. The smart ones had black front people. Mm -hmm. um, and I even interviewed a man here who had uh, a hoodoo store for, his parents had it for 75 years. 75 he was, years. He was born in the store, he said. His name was Alan Silverberg. He's passed on now. His daughter, who at the time was, I'm going to say, was probably in her early 60s when I talked to her. Um, and I discovered that their lab was up, was on top of the store. And the stuff they were selling was, they'd take like baby powder, put some blue food color in it, turn it blue, mm -hmm. you know, stick it on a jar and sell it to us as a magical power of some kind. Um, the other thing about, about this Bible stuff is we would see, say, a certain verse, like you said, we would see something in that, and we would take it and we would modify it mm -hmm. to 
to suit our needs, to suit our historical memory, to suit our experience. So we wouldn't just simply take it at face value. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of an example. Um, we would modify it and transform it to fit our paradigm and to fit our needs at the moment. Um, and that's how we use the Bible. Mm -hmm. We didn't just simply say, oh, here's a good holy book, let's just read it. No. We took that thing and transformed it, just like we've done so much of what we've gotten from them. We've taken it and reworked it, reshaped it like clay to fit who we are and to use it when nothing else was available. As the old folks say, we could hit a straight lick with a crooked stick, and that's what we did with the Bible. Mm -hmm. We hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. <laughs> right. Literally. <It's>, um, <laughs> That reminds me of, so, in one of our texts in the Kuku Tuntun, the divine wisdom is Sesha. She's the female scribe. She's the woman of divine wisdom, or female divinity of divine wisdom, and Tehuti is the male divinity. Because they always talk about him, but they don't talk about the, the female divinity. One of his titles is Fa in ancient Kamei. So, that's of course, that's the Fa. <laughs> that's, that's the that's title, Oromila. Yeah, because I saw an account. Wow, uh, this was not, this was a sort of, North Central Africa, where, let me just see who this was among. My girlfriend was in this country. It was in, out of Mali, I think this came. Okay. They have something that they call Da Fa, which is a divination reading. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, it looks like Ifa. And I said, well, yeah, that looks, you know, before I knew anything at all about Ifa, it just hit me that that has to be related to Ifa. Mm -hmm. Dafa was the practice of casting whatever vehicle you were using. That was the actual practice of reading. So to throw Ifa to Dafa, I thought, oh my God, this thing is much more widespread than I thought it was. I thought it was like confined, you know, to Nigeria and that was it. Mm -hmm. No! Right. <laughs> and they try to make, unfortunately some people try to make things Europocentric. I <laughs> saw so everything happening, but you have Afa and Ibo and Ifa, a 16 symbol divination all over the western part of the continent. But they'll say, for example, fa means to scrape or to scratch. They talk about scra yes. scratching the yerosum and the divination powder. Right. But the title of Tehuti, he's called fa, font, but at the end is nasal, so he's font. It means he of the great nose because he has the great beak, he's a crane, and they show him scratching and going up under the surface to pull out what needs to be saying. Mm -hmm. So when they talk about scratching and scraping, that's what fa means, and you go up under the surface, and that's the title of the male divinity. But, you know, it's, it's the same thing. But the whole biblical thing, one of his titles is Ma'ah Sheh, which is he who is true of word, he speaks the divine law. And Ma'ashe was corrupted into Moshe and Moses, and Tehuti has, you know, a staff with serpents encircling the staff. And he's a spokesperson for Ra and so forth, and Amen and Ra and Amenet. So when they say Moshe with the serpent, with the staff, with the serpents, and raising up the serpent, and you know, a conjurer and so forth, we just we knew inherently that that's really Tehuti that they're corrupting. So if we read something like that in the Bible, it's something that's like, where'd they get that from? Now some of our people won't discriminate. They'll say, oh, well, Moses was a conjurer, <laughs> but something is telling us that they stole this from somewhere else need to look at the other source. But then that brings in what you talked about between World War I and then World War II and how things flip. So first you, you talked about the original tradition around the plantations. We still, you know, you know, we're still practicing because, you know, first generation, second generation off the boats and so forth. We know who we are, we still speak our language, we do things, you know, in, in clandestinely and so forth, but we know who we are. But then things start shifting, we get shifted around, emancipation happens, some of the migration towards the north begins to happen, but then the great migration starts. So between, you say between World War I and World War II, it's something to start to be, you know, yeah, commercialized within after that. The demise of Dr. Buzzard, if I'm not mistaken, I think mm -hmm. that may be the time of that chapter, because that's when we really, really, it's earlier, a little earlier. Right after World War One, if I remember correctly. So you're thinking like the twenties, thirties? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we start to become um, victimized by okay. 
these sort of outside people. We still do have our own conjurers and our own weak people inside of our own community, and the belief is very, very strong. Mm -hmm. And you could walk into any black church on Sunday and find mojo bags in so many people's pockets while they're sitting up there praising Jesus. Mm -hmm. They still have not relinquished those ancestors, as Nana Pazant says. Um, and even today, um, I interviewed a woman in North Carolina, a sister in North Carolina, who told me, she said, if you want to find a real hoodoo worker, you've got to go to the black church. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? Okay. Then, not too long after that, I went to Texas to a family reunion. And I was, I guess I started to work on this book, or at least think about it. And in the entire county, there's nobody further removed from me than second cousin. I mean, everybody was a relative of mine. Okay. And they have their own cemetery, and they have their own little church that they built. So we were off doing something, and when we came back, everybody said, well, let's go over to the church. When we pulled up in front of the church, there was somebody in there, and I mean, they were preaching. They were throwing down old style, old religion, deep south, fire and brimstone preaching. Mm -hmm. I mean, that old preaching, grunting and grunting preaching. And I said to my guy, who is that in there preaching like that? And he said, that's your first cousin Howard. I said, winehead Howard? Uh -huh. <laughs> I was not a winehead, but I'm like, sitting Howard? Okay. Yeah. So I said, well, let me talk to you later. So I kind of eased over to him. So, you know, I didn't, but I didn't use the word voodoo right away because I knew the reaction I was going to get. I kind of said, well, you know, well, and I told him, and finally I came out and said, do you, do you know I put roots on anybody? <laughs> I don't remember putting no roots on nobody. I don't, I don't remember putting no roots on nobody. He said, oh, no, 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 don't even ask me nothing about that. Oh, that's, that's the devil. So after I talked to a lady in North Carolina, I rethought my conversation with Howard. And while I was there talking to him, I said, ask the other question, Katrina, ask the other question. So I said to him, do you know how to take roots off of somebody? He said, well, yeah, I know how to take them off. I'll see. And that's no. how I found my voodoo workers. Mm -hmm. I went and I asked, who knows how to take roots off? They were more open to And then the voodoo workers appeared. Right. Okay. That's how I found them. To, they they would all take it off. Mm -hmm. would nobody admit to being able to put it on. Right. That <laughs> statement, they were fearful. And that made all the difference in my writing, too. It did, it did something for me mentally mm -hmm. when, when I discovered that, that that's right. what you find. What was that early code switch? <laughs> they were code switching on. Oh, already. yeah. Yeah, oh, so. yeah. We learned that on the ship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't right. even have to get off the ship to right. figure that one. Oh, yeah. yeah. So now, when you talk about the so, 20s and 30s, but we're still maintaining tradition, primarily, even though some people are starting to get a little wayward, but then between World War I and II, and especially with the Great Migration, and millions of black people starting to move up into the industrial centers, and you have this urbanization of hoodoo, yeah. and then you talk about the marketeers, yeah. which was yeah. One of the, you know, that aspect of your and research is very other important. And other things enter as well, like candle burning, for example, mm -hmm. which I think specifically comes out of Louisiana and the influence of the Catholic Church mm -hmm. with all those candles. Right. That, that's just a guess on my part, but I can't think of any other place that we might have gotten that, that candle burning thing. Mm -hmm. um, and with, with the wax being the holding element, um, you know, for the power. And in fact, when I had some work done in Cuba, one of the things that, that he did, one of the things that the, uh, that the priest did was to use some candle wax, a little white candle and dropped the wax, and sealed an amulet for me in wax. Mm -hmm. You know, and just shut it off from any contact with the outside world and made it airtight by using candles. And of course, you know, they're held with Catholic mm -hmm. there, so. I wasn't all that surprised that candles came into play. But um, Cassandra Wims's work on candle shops, I think, does a really good job of talking about that particular manifestation of hoodoo, why hoodoo shows itself in these candle shops. 
um, between the two world wars, we really become scattered. There are still people in the Deep South who are practicing the old Black Belt tradition okay. at this time. And there's still a few there. Um, even though during that period of time, the commercialization of it starts to creep in. Mm -hmm. um, and not only for us, but throughout the Caribbean as well. You get the same uh, hoodoo catalogs okay. being sent to people in the Caribbean, to churches in the Caribbean. Um, what I found was I was to talk to a woman from Antigua who told me about the catalogs coming onto the island of Antigua when she was a child. She's probably um, 70 now, you know, or maybe a little older, maybe 72 ish. Um, I was like, oh, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the people that published that catalog. It's a very prominent name in Hoodoo. Like it's a name you see frequently. Um, not the, was it DeLorean? Something like that. I don't remember the exact name. Okay. But they literally take over Hoodoo uh, and start. And this is mail order Hoodoo for people. Mail order Hoodoo. <laughs> you know. And start manufacturing this thing. Right. Um, and then you get the people that I call the marketeers, those who see the opportunity to slide right on in and make as much money as possible from us. Um, and they you know, put on this persona, and sometimes they would wrap their heads up in turbans and pretend to be uh, Hindus mm -hmm. um, or some such exoticized individual from somewhere in the exotic world. Um, and that was all to mystify the practice, to get our money out of our pockets. And we still have a lot of them around today. Exactly. <laughs> and in exactly. fact, there may be more of them than authentic hoodoo workers because they are more difficult to find today. Mm -hmm. um, some of the people I interview, I'm not sure how I found, ah, I know how I found Brother. No, I don't know how I found Brother Gregory. Uh, it was Queen Kit, Marquette of Goodwine, um, who, took the me, yep, who took me to to Brother Gregory. Okay. He is her cousin. Okay. And she literally took me to his house. Um, and that's how I think I met him. I think I called him though earlier, but the fact that she was able to take me there was mm -hmm. just, you know, an added benefit for me. Right. Because she is his cousin. Okay. And he's the great grandson of the famous Stephanie Robinson, Dr. Mm -hmm. Buzzard, probably America's most famous hoodoo man who really had some white folks in the legal profession a little disturbed, a little upset. They were concerned about him. Um, uh, what really got the uh, attention of the authorities is when he started giving men a plant concoction that he had made that would make their hearts flutter when they went to take their selective service exams. Okay. And they would be exempt from service. <laughs> And some of the white folks heard about it as the white men came and got this thing from him and they started doing it too. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how he got caught, but he got caught. And he was tried. He and another guy that was in the area, Dr. Bug, that's his yeah. name, Dr. Bug, mm -hmm. um, was also tried. But I don't think that Stephanie Robinson was convicted. I think Dr. Bug was convicted, though he did serve time. One of, the, one of the charges that the hoodoo doctors would be hit with, and, and during this period of time, you get the solidification of the American Medical Association, mm -hmm. you know, uh, toward the end of the 19th century as we go into the 20th century. Okay. The American medical profession sort of solidifies its power, and that is what kills a lot of the conjure women because okay. the conjure women would frequently disguise themselves as midwives. Okay. And okay. I went through the midwife roles in North Carolina. And in fact, that chapter on um, healing the sick, raising the dead, who do his health care, right. where I talk about the midwives. And of the 60 midwives that were operating in a particular county, only five of them were literally reporting that they had delivered babies. Mm -hmm. But if only five or six were delivering babies, what are the other 55 doing? Right. Walking around with these bags like they're delivering babies. Mm -hmm. They're working roots. They're right. working conjure. And the midwives were an essential part of the supply line because 
the calls, the veils, the babies are born with calls. Right. The midwife could get that and give that or sell that to the conjure doctor. Mm -hmm. um, also, umbilical cords and placentas were used in hoodoo, um, along with any bodily excretion, perspiration, urine, spit, all of that's believed to have spiritual power. So all of that was used. But the midwives were literally driven out of business. Not only the conjure women midwives, but the actual midwives were all that's why we have black midwives in America. And black midwives dominated the profession well into the 1950s. There were the only white midwives that I discovered as I was examining the country and looking for midwives, the only white midwives that I discovered were those that were Scandinavians in the northern part of the country, in places like Minnesota, out in rural communities. Okay. And they had come from the old country, they had come from Europe. They were not Americans. So it had been taken over, just like cooking was seen as Negro work. Right. And so you get this high culinary tradition being established by black folks, which nobody's willing to acknowledge. You know, but things like French fries and solid ice cream and macaroni and cheese, all of that is brought to the United States by Africans. Uh, that they bring that high culinary tradition because there was African royalty that was kidnapped. They didn't just take prisoners of war who were already slaves. Mm -hmm. Once the slave raiding starts, they don't care if you know, if you're important in your country. Right. They need you in this time field, nigga, get over here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole different ball game. And so they scooped up anybody they could. And, and they brought important people. They brought engineers and priests and, you know, just a range of people that you find in the population. It but seems but, but during that period, once the midwives are killed, they also attack the undertakers. Okay. Because the black undertakers are also essential in the hoodoo trade. There was an entire hoodoo network that was not only the conjurers, but midwives, undertakers, grave diggers were all part of that hoodoo complex, that hoodoo profession. The grave diggers, my oh God, they could get you graveyard dirt. They could literally dig up bones for you. Right. Um, you know, they were, and the, there were also black pharmacists and black pharmacy assistants that would smuggle things out. And I think that this thing with high John, the jello food itself was in every apothecary because it was a laxative, it's a purgative. And you can, you know, get a, a, a what's that thing called? Um, that you, a grater. And you can grate that root and take that powder, and you can find instructions on how much of it to take as a laxative. Okay. So it had real medicinal uses. Um, but I, I, I do want to ask you a question about um, this high John thing. But before, I just want to say about the midwife. Um, so even though now, probably in the last 10 years, there's a a resurgence yeah. of this whole midwife, but they're making it popular now. Yeah. It's like 15 years ago they started making breastfeeding naturally popular when for a while they were trying to force us on <laughs> and all that. So you see people moving in that direction and black women are becoming that same midwife, black midwife societies and yeah. stuff like that. Right. Um, Finally. <laughs> right. It, and I would say the influence of people who got back involved in ancestral religion has pushed some of the people who are not. Mm -hmm consciously and subconsciously back into these that's, that's natural That's true, things. because I advocate for that. I had a midwife delivery 36 years ago. Okay. Okay? And I had to have a white midwife. Mm -hmm. There were no black midwives. Right. And in fact, I was in Rhode Island, and Rhode Island was the only state in the union at the time that had licensed midwives. The okay. only state in the union that had licensed midwives. And that was when you, that was like? 1987, I was there. Okay. I went there in September of 86, and my daughter was born in April of 87. Okay. I was there on a postdoctoral fellowship at Brown. When I got there, I discovered I was pregnant at the age of 38. <laughs> okay. So I had a natural <laughs> right. birth at just about, I was almost 39. It was a few weeks before I turned 39. Okay. And I breastfed for a year and a week. And, you know, I advocate, and I tell women all the time that 
If you have a natural birth, you will not have all the pain that you have if you have a birth at a hospital. Mm -hmm. And I told I don't know what these women are talking about pain. I don't. I had one, what was it? I would describe it as a hard menstrual cramp. Okay. But nothing that you don't have if you have bad cramps. Right. And I only had one. Mm -hmm. And that was my last contraction and I was fully dying and the midwife said, wow. Okay. So, because you're not given Pitocin, I would not let them put that stuff in my arm. I was not taking IV. Mm -hmm. You know, no, you're not going to give me Pitocin. And Pitocin is that drug that speeds up your labor mm -hmm. and it intensifies your labor. But what's wrong with doing that is that the birth process is a coordinated hormonal process. And so once labor starts, other things start to happen in the body. And those other things that happen are dependent upon the timing of the labor. So for example, well, labor starts to start. And when you get to a certain stage in labor, your body will automatically start to lubricate the birth canal. Okay. The birth canal will become slippery. I mean slippery, like ice slippery. Mm -hmm. But if you use Pitocin, it will intensify that labor before the lubrication oh, okay. starts. So it so disrupts, hard. exactly, so it disrupts the whole timing, the hormonal timing of the labor process and the birth process. And it makes all kinds of things necessary now. That you wouldn't have to do it if you just had, um, just had natural birth. Um, I was discouraged from having it. Um, my first trip was to a doctor, and the doctor and the nurse said, oh, you're an elderly prenate. <sighs> so, were they calling me an old gorilla? Right, you're a primate, you thought it was a... Did you just call me an old monkey? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're an elderly premate, and this is a premium pregnancy for you, so you don't want anything to go wrong, do you? Right. Scaring you, setting you up for a cesarean section. Exactly. I noticed this, um, I what you were saying about the midwives and the undertakers and that whole network. Like now, people who practice, I know a number of people who practice ancestral religion, one of the legitimate ways they can practice while also having a profession is they'll go into social work, they'll be therapists, they'll be psychologists, you know, because once, once you get in that therapy session, you can do whatever you yes. want. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's confidential. So they can practice, you know, they can work a regular, quote unquote, full time job, but they can practice their tradition. And it sounds like some of that, even though part of it was just naturally this is what we do, but it seems like some of that was happening when you're talking about the midwives. They were considered, you know, they were midwives, but they could also practice their tradition under the guise of a traditional profession. And then you have the undertakers, which is a regular profession. Yeah. But these are, you know, hoodoo priests. So you have the women conducting the ancestral spirit into the world and the men conducting the, the person who's going to become an ancestral spirit back into the spirit realm with yeah. the midwife and the undertaker. But it seems like they were, they found professions that they could practice the tradition fully, even though it's quote unquote hidden, you know, in the tradition. The pharmacy assistants, too, th those went all the way back into slavery. I found accounts of not only pharmacy assistants and doctor's assistants, I found one example of a doctor's assistant who was actually trained by the doctor and he became a doctor and he actually wrote a medical book. Okay. This was an enslaved man. Okay. Literally wrote a medical book. So a good number of those people that were enslaved had achieved a high level of confidence in, in medicine. Okay. We're taking this short break to let our viewers and listeners know about our nine archived online hoodoo courses. We conducted a series of nine courses online. Some of them are four-week courses. Some of them are six-week courses. All nine courses are available as a special for our listeners for $50 for the entire nine-course hoodoo set. Trustery, cosmology, ritual medicine, divination, and more. Simply go to our website, ojirafo.com, on the Akongwa Suya page, and you can access all nine courses. Now, back to our interview. 
Now, I want to ask you, so, now, talking about the midwives, undertakers, the whole network of traditional priestesses and priests, really, that's what they were, who mm -hmm. were women, conjure men, conjure women. Um, and even when you look in ancient Kemet, for example, the divinity Anpu, he's the one that governs the mummification process, so he's an undertaker. Mm -hmm. So, they continued that whole, whole tradition. But when we get into the urbanization aspect, who becomes urban, urbanized? On one hand, it's, you know, wherever we go in the world, we have to adapt to the location. If it's snowing, we can't access or procure certain herbs and so forth. We have to figure out another way. So there's an urbanization process that takes place. But after, when you were talking about the Second World War, you get into the 40s, but then you start getting to the 50s, 60s, 70s. And then the marketeers really, you know, and to take hold. To the really get us. So now, and, and you know, there's kind of a resurgence of that with social media, Instagram, and Facebook, and so forth. And yeah. a lot of marketeers in our own community <laughs> who, you know, don't necessarily fully understand the tradition. But um, one example that you use that we talked about, and I want you to expound upon, which really encapsulates the idiocy <laughs> of people who are not really in the tradition and not, don't have a blood connection to this tradition, no spirit genetic connection, but they're making declarative statements about what who <laughs> is and what it isn't. Um, well, first, before we get to that, when we look at um, publications like the Hoodoo and Conjure um, work, the multi-volume set by Middleton, oh, yeah. you talk about the interviewer effect. Now, there's a difference. So you. You went all around the country, you connected with people, real workers and so forth, and they gave you access because you're, you know, you're part of the community. Now, he writes this multi-volume set, going all over the country. Of course, some people are going to tell him certain things, and some people are not, but what, is the, what do people need to read between the lines for a work like that? There's a, a brother who wrote a dissertation on Harry Middleton Hyatt. Okay. And, I, and I have a copy of that, and I went through that, and that told me what to read between the lines. Okay. Um, one of the things Harry Hyatt does is he passes for black. Okay. He passes himself off as a black man who could pass for white. Like okay. an Adam Clayton Hall. Right. You right. know, we got those in my thought community. You know, mm -hmm. I got relatives that look even more quote white than I look, that mm -hmm. I'm, you know, are black people. That will, you know, be very disturbed at you if you tell me you're not. Right. And so, that's what Harry Milton Hyatt did. And he would, uh, when he arrived in a town, he would make sure he went to the black cab instead of the white cab at the Greyhound bus station, mm -hmm. the bus station. And he would tell him, oh no, you know, I'll just pass it. And he would tell the black cab driver that he was a hoodoo man, and that he was going to be staying at the such and such a hotel, a little black hotel, and that he would be paying people five dollars. Now think about how much five dollars meant when he did that. At, I mean, in our community, mm -hmm. rural people, many of them probably sharecroppers or are working for somebody else in some menial paying job. Families were larger, they had more kids than people have today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be in that line too. Right. And I might not know anything about Hoodoo, but I'll tell him anything mm -hmm. to get that five dollars. And I'll have my cousins and my friends and my brothers and sisters. Come on, man, this man give me away money. All you want you to do is you can make up anything. You just tell your story and you <laughs> and get that five dollars. Okay. That's what a lot of what you find in Harry Middleton Hyatt. Mm -hmm. So I would be wary and keep that in mind when you read him. Um, uh, and then if, if you get a chance to get the dissertation on how he really goes into great detail okay. on who this guy was and how he proceeded. Um, I'm just trying to get the name of the author. Um, so yeah, Hyatt does that. The other thing is that Hyatt, in addition to the interviewer effect, um, because people think that he's black, mm -hmm. That's designed to make them open up and reveal, because he knows they might not talk, we wouldn't talk to a white man about it, so he passes for black. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, people tell him anything. I see things in there that's like, where did this come from? <laughs> <laughs> like the nation sack. Right, that's what we want to get to. <laughs> like the nation sack, which he mentions only once 
and there's only one interview, and in all of those five volumes, there's only one person that mentions the nature sack. Mm -hmm. And he writes it down as nation sack. Well, let's, so let's get into that, because that, that's what I wanted to talk about. That's, that's just a, a very poignant example of how, you know, Eurasians trying to, you know, overtake the tradition, which of course they never can, they can't be part of that. But um, on the Lucky Mojo site, they're talking, and you know, when you look at the Lucky Mojo site, it's, it's run by a cracker, so a lot of misinformation, but then they also take information from, you know, black people and, um, I had a friend talk about how she went through a class on that site and they ask you for everything that your grandparents and great-grandparents ever told you about the tradition and you have to write a paper and then they have rights to that. That's what, that's what she said. So they're taking stuff from our people and we're paying them to give them our stories. They take the information, put it on a website, act like they're authorities, but it's so much misinformation. So she, you look on the site and she talks about a, a nation sack. I think that's designed to impress people right. with the esoteric nature of the knowledge. Right. So now what's the difference, <laughs> and you mentioned this in the book, <laughs> but this is a perfect example of how, you know, the enemy um, misinforms our people. Oh. So what's the difference <laughs> between what they call it a nation sack and the nature sack? Well, you know, that, that's, it's almost a double whammy because they're doing two things. They're undermining our knowledge of ourselves. By, by claiming that they're correcting our English. Right. Because the term was not nation sack. We would never pronounce that final consonant. That was my first hint that something was wrong, the pronunciation of that N. We would never have done that, especially in 1920. Right. And I don't even do it. Mm -hmm. and, and when I'm talking to just regular folks, none of them do it. Right. So that was my first suspicion. Um, secondly, but this can't be the correct name. What could this person be talking about? So I began to say the word, the term nation sack over and over again in my head and out loud as my great grandfather would have said, Papa. Everybody said, Oh, you know, Papa's just old rice eating Geechee. You know, Papa can't talk right. So I began to say this over and over in my head. Nation sack, nation sack. Ah, that's when it dawned on me that they were talking about the old who do nature sack. Mm -hmm. Yipes. And they corrected our English because, you know, we don't know how to talk. Right. <laughs> right. We haven't been talking, you know, for, for a given the times. Right. Right. You know, we just, oh, I don't know how it gets across, but we just, you know, we can't talk. <laughs> right. So they correct our English. And there are numerous examples of that in, in the research literature. Um, I won't go into it, but that example about the, the Mr. Cooler. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I did, and whenever I come across that, I try to go back into my great grandfather's head and try to pronounce it as he would have pronounced it, which will bring me closer to the material if it really existed. Um, there are a couple of other things I try to do too, but that one mainly to just see if I can come up with a term that I heard the old folks use it. And I certainly wouldn't talk about nature sack. Right. And that was something that was generally only tied by women. Um, I never heard of a man tying it because it's, it's um, gender specific. It's used by women to control their, their, their man's, um, what's the term I want? Um, not just for loyalty, but their loyalty mm -hmm. um, to them. It's to prevent him from having sex with other women, basically. Right. Um, and this nature sack is supposed to do that. It, it's supposed to fix the man so that he can only get an erection with his woman. That he will not be able to achieve an erection with any other woman. And that's the idea behind the, nation, the, the nature sack. And the term for sexuality or virility, as the old folks use it, was nature. Right. You know, and that's when it dawned on me. She's talking about a nature sack. She's got this thing all wrong. Of course, what really kills me is when I see people online saying they know how to make one. I know how to make a nation sack. Right. And that is what they know how to make a nation sack. Because they right. don't know how to make their own nature sack. Right. Because I haven't seen the instructions correct yet. Mm -hmm. And I knew a woman that knew how to do it, Miss Mary, who I interviewed for the book. Who, she's the person that told me that it had to be tied during sex. Mm 
-hmm. You know, it's not anything you can go to, you know, I'm going to do it and you're over there somewhere next week. It has to be done during the sex act. Right. Or it's not um, efficacious. It, you know, it's not supposed to work. Exactly. And that's just the, the arrogance of, you know, the whites and their offspring to think so that they're correcting it. something, but at the same time, the entire cosmological foundation of the ritual talisman, they have no clue about, but they make declarative statements. And then that can just be applied to 99% of what they're talking about. And, and that's what people are doing. I find people a lot, even some of the, even some of the black folks mm -hmm. that are doing some of the hoodoo sites, their ultimate source was that site. Yes. That's a lot of them. Right. Um, I went to a, um, the National African Religion Congress when Mambo Angela was alive. She would produce a volume. That was here in Philly. Right? Yeah. Okay. She would produce a volume that had a list of all of the African traditional priests and priestesses from all the traditions. Mm -hmm. The Abbasan tradition, the Bukumi tradition, people that, that were practicing um, the, 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 working with the Mkisi. It's just She just had it all. But they never had anything about her. And so I asked Miss Mary if she would come to that conference with me. I sent a ticket and flew her into Philadelphia. Okay. And we went to that and they certified her as a hoodoo worker. She was the first hoodoo worker to be brought into the National African okay. Religion Congress. And then we drove to South Carolina and went to see Brother Gregory. Mm -hmm. So Miss Mary, Brother Gregory, and I sat for a couple of days and just talked about the tradition. Okay. And boy, just to hear those two hoodoo workers. And they knew each other. Oh, really? They okay. already knew each other, yeah. Okay. They knew each other. They hadn't seen each other for years, but they mm -hmm. immediately recognized each other. And I wondered, who else did they know? Because mm -hmm. what that group said to me is that there is still an informal network right. of people that are that know each other, that work together, that share knowledge and information. Miss Mary has passed away, but Brother Gregory's still alive and well. Mm -hmm. And he's probably 70, okay. 71, 72. Uh, there was a younger worker, and I would like to find him. He has a number of names. One of his names was Dr. Cosmos. But when I talked to him, he was really in touch with the old material. Okay. And he had a mojo bag that he called the Four Corners of the Earth. Okay. And it was literally four mojo bags in one. And I thought to myself, now where did he get this idea? What does he think? And then I saw the Lamont Collection, which is a private collection of Congolese artifacts and implements. And they had several drawings. And I might have included one of the drawings in the book okay. of a Congolese mojo bag that looks exactly like what Brother Gregory does. Mm -hmm. And also, when he wraps his mojo bags, I noticed something. As he wrapped this one for me, he did 16 turns of the knot, of the 16, 16. Mm -hmm. There's 16 no dudes of Ephraim. There's 16. And each one of those terms of the thread, he put it, he said a Bible verse in. Now, when my godfather tied this first hand of Ephah on my wrist, he tied 16 knots. There are 16 knots there. Mm -hmm. And every knot he tied, he said a old do of Ephah into. And I said, oh my God, Brother Gregory did the exact collateral thing. Right, the exact the same, same thing. thing. Yes. You just didn't know the, That's right. the specifics. But he wrapped 16 times. Each rap he put a sacred saying into, but in his case it was the Old Testament, for my godfather with the old dudes of Ephah. Mm -hmm. But the actual process itself was exactly the same, and the mojo bag that Brother Gregory gave me looks exactly like what's in the Lamar's collection. Mm -hmm. Boy, oh boy. Are some of these cash clothes. That was, um, so the Lamar collection, that was, where, where did they find it? At? It's, it's from the Congo, it's still from the Congo. Now, where the Lamont collection is, is located, I have to go back and look in my, I know it's because I have a, a book on it. Okay. And that's where I discovered all this stuff. When I saw the mojo bags that were in the Lamont collection, I thought they were from the deep south. Okay. Oh, my God, look at this stuff. 
I mean, this looks exactly, no variation, exactly like the Mojo Bays that are wrapped here in the United States. And that's, that's just that cultural continuity, even to this point, with everything that's happened, we're still, you know, maintaining. There have been some recently, you mentioned about they found the, when we were talking earlier about finding the Akan drums. Yes, yes. Um, some of these, e even with us, um, Oh, we, we've shown it, we wrote an article about the Uru doll baby, and it's the Akuaba and Akan, but there was a, um, basically my Insamafo ancestors and ancestors told me to get an Akuaba doll. So, of course, people know about the Akuaba dolls in Akan tradition, they're, they're the quote-unquote fertility dolls with the mm -hmm. large head and the mm -hmm. tomorrow sticking out, and they're the same form of the Ankh and ancient Kemet and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the onks were used for fertility, but they were also used for funerary purposes. You know, I hadn't yeah. thought about that because I have one of those. But you just opened my eyes to a whole series of things just now. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh boy. A new book. <laughs> a new book. Oh, no, because I hadn't thought about but it is exactly the shape of the onks. I'll send you the article we published on that because it's, we found out later. So, people always see the onk and you see the deities holding the onk and they put it by the nose of the individual to en enlighten them. But that's. On one hand, it's fertility, but then they also use it for funerary purposes. And in Akan, the Akuba dolls are used for f fertility, but they're also used for funerary purposes. That's interesting, because I went to Doc Ben's funeral and wake. Oh, okay. Some people came from the High Lodge in Luxor, mm -hmm. and they came in with ox okay. over his body. Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of wondered, well, what's that doing? Because they didn't explain it, they just did it. Right. But now you say it's also used. Well, now, right. I, now I understand why they were there with those Because most people, if they read about onk, the word onk means life. Onk, onku, it means life. So they're like, oh, it's, it's life. But they don't think about it in the funerary context. And then the same word onkwa in Akan means life. That's the word for life. And the onkwa, huh. kua is the same. But the thing is, we so when my Samago say you need to get an akua doll, you know, for ritual purposes, I, you know, I purchased some from, you know, vendors and things like that. But they said, no, you need one from here. You need a quote-unquote African-American quote doll. I'm like, oh. So I got up and went, went online, and there was an auction house. And, and it's the, we, we have the image. We wrote a little short couple-page article about this. There was an auction house, and they were selling what they called an African-American slave doll. And it was found in Virginia in the 1700s on a plantation. It was an Akua doll. All the features, the, the motif, everything that you would see, it's the specific form of the kind of round-headed Akua doll. And Where it was, was it found? It was found in Virginia in the 1700s. And, and it's a car. Right. So, but they didn't know what it was. They just so said African-American slave doll. That drum is also... Right, you said that was from Virginia. Yeah, Virginia. Southern Virginia. So I know like Richmond, um, in that area, as well as parts of, like you talk about North Carolina, the Richmond, Virginia, the Carolinas. There was a, lo a lot of our kind of people who went to th those areas and were, you know, enslaved in those areas first. As well as some people in Alabama and stuff like that, but that region, even if you look on Ancestry.com and people doing their genealogical charts and so forth, but also utilizing the DNA, They'll talk about the mid-Atlantic coast, quote unquote, African Americans, and they'll talk about how a large population of Akan speaking people were forced into the Virginia area, North Carolina, That's South Carolina, Carolina Washington, DC. Right. That is in Dean Epstein's book. That's an Ashanti slash Akan drum. But, I mean, that's the actual drum. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there probably was a big population of Akan people in right. southern Virginia, maybe northern North, that whole area. Mm -hmm. Maybe even over into Tennessee, because Tennessee and North Carolina used to be the same state at one point. And before they, or, or before they started separating things yeah. out. And before they became like the, um, incorporated to the union. It was just that, that territory. But that's, um, people are starting to pay attention. It made me pay attention. When they told me to do that, I found it online. They were selling it for $550. <laughs> um, one of our elders is in our SE saw it and, and purchased it. So we retrieved it, but that's an ancestral oh, icon yes. artifact that we have in our possession inside our shrine. 
But people are starting to pay attention and look in these different areas. Sometimes you'll look at a newspaper and they'll say they found this cache of you know, ritual items in the plantation in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Now we know what we're looking at when we see that. And just like you can do some archaeology on the continent or ancient connect mm -hmm. and you know, unearth these artifacts, we have our own archaeology. We have oh, our yes. own artifacts and we need to, you know, grab those. I had the chance to go down to the University of Maryland. In fact, um, I give thanks to some people and I thank him for the afternoon and the lunch. Um, there was a professor who had conducted an archaeological dig. Okay. And they had all the artifacts there at the University of Maryland at College Park. Okay. And I went down there. And when I got there, they had all the artifacts laid out on these huge tables. And they had them laid in the position that they found them in during the dig. Okay. So they had some things were in the north corner, some things were in the south corner. And mm -hmm. When I walked up, they asked, they said, tell us what you see. <laughs> I went there to get information from them. They were getting it from me. I had no right. idea. That they didn't know anything. I thought, okay. you know, they got this, whoa, I need to go down and see that. Right. Um, there was a little blue bottle. Okay. And there was something in it. It was some kind of ball or something. So I don't know if it was a dead insect that had dried up in there, or if it mm -hmm. was a pebble. Or, well, it didn't sound like a pebble when I shook the bottle. But when I saw that glass bottle, the first thing I thought of was walking boy. Mm -hmm. It had to be a conjurer's walking boy, because that's what the divination device, the walking boy, was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was hung from a string. It was a bottle. And it worked like a pendulum. But apparently there was something in that bottle like an insect. My guess is that it was an insect or some kind of worm or something mm -hmm. that could make that bottle move. To give it that divinatory yeah. function. Yeah, and so they would hang it and it would do its thing and this insect would make the bottle swing in certain directions and they used that as the reading device. It was called a walking boy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I mean, I could just literally imagine seeing the conjurer with this thing in his hand handling it just like the Puele chain. Right. That's exactly what came to mind when I when I first read about the walking boy. I thought, oh my God, that's supposed to be exactly how the Puele chain is because it's hung from the finger and it's kind of allowed to swing freely. And the Puele chain is before it's dropped. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh boy, there's a lot more there than we are even willing to recognize. Right. But part of the problem is also is that we don't know anything about the traditions that preceded this stuff. So many people don't know how to contextualize it. If I were not familiar with the Puebla chain, I wouldn't have been able to say anything about the right. walking boy. Right. And I also noticed that once I got initiated into Yoruba, that gave me, I said in the book, an additional set of grips with mm -hmm. which to handle hoodoo. Right. And it did because it gave me an African traditional religion that I could bounce it off of, mm -hmm. just to see are there are there collateral forms or something that might that might resemble okay. collateral forms. But yeah, there are collateral forms, just like that ring shell and that that walking boy. And I think there are other things too. Mm -hmm. um, I've been curious about about this high jump thing. There had to have been a collateral form, the original form on the continent. And when we get here, we don't find that. Why we don't use buckeyes more, but we do use buckeyes and horse chestnuts, similar to the way that we carry the high giant boots, because I've had a lot of old black people ask me to go get them some buckeyes when I was a kid. Go oh, down the line, you bring me some of them buckeyes, baby. And my granddaddy would not be caught without buckeyes in his left pocket. Okay. In fact, I've got all my daddy's buckeyes at home right now, mm -hmm. right on the ancestor shrine, the ones that he carried in his pocket. And as I went through the, the I went through the Florida Negro, that was that piece put together by Zora Neale Hurston, and it's in the okay. archives down there in Tallahassee, the original manuscript. Uh, and as I went through Florida Negro, I saw photographs, and then I went through um, Newbill Niles' pockets, mm -hmm. photographs. 
New Bill Niles pockets. Papers are in Cleveland, Ohio, in the Cleveland Public Library. Okay. And so I had a chance to go through some of those boxes and I saw numerous photographs. In both instances, of black folks with buck eyes. Okay. And I suspect that they were using that as a substitute for some root plant that was sacred in the homeland. Mm -hmm. um, why? Hi, John becomes what it becomes is still a, it really became a question after I read your piece on high John. So how did I, I was able to explain how it gets out of Mexico because it, it only grows one place in the world. It's only native to Mexico and only native to a particular region in Mexico, Xolapa province, which gives it with its name or, or it gives the area's name. And this guy, Gaspar Yungo, was actually executed in a jello field. And so I suspected that that was the, the, one of the models because I found some semblance of a rebel leader that couldn't be broken, that had a strong connection to Africa. That, he was not the only one I found. He was just the only one I talked about because he's so famous. Yeah, but famous. I found it in um, Bras Coop was his name because his arm was cut off. Mm -hmm. You know, Bras and French's arm, Bras Coop, cut arm is what he was called. But he was a famous maroon in Bayou St. John, right off the coast of Louisiana. He set up an entire maroon community. Mm -hmm. um, he was eventually captured, executed, and it's said that people took bits of his body when they could get it and turned it into Gregory. Mm -hmm. um, so I found that one. I also found a rebel leader in a community the community was called Mandinga. Okay. That was the name of the community itself, Mandinga. And so I found more than just high John. Apparently, this was more than just a trope. These guys appeared wherever the circumstances demanded it. Right. That's um, like, for example, we talk about Yama or Jama Kakaru in, in the article. Yes. That's um, so you have the Aquamu people. So the Asante is the largest Akan group, then you have the Apama, who's a subgroup, they're not as big as the Asante, but at the time they had a big empire. Before the Asante Empire became big, the Apama was the big empire, military empire and so forth. The Apama Hini, the Apama King, had a lieutenant, he was the Asafo Hini, which means the mm -hmm. warrior chief basically. And that was Nyama, was called Nyama or Jama and so forth. Him and his people were captured and sent to St. John's Island in the Caribbean. So they ended up making him the foreman because they saw him as a leader, but he was considered a royal, you know, by his people. Like he was, you know, he was a royal. He was a henny, which is the term for king, mm -hmm. but also a royal. So they like, oh, he's, he's the one. So um, the thing about him is, so you have ginger on the right. continent which originally came from the Caribbean, but they were exporting. The other direction, yes. Like so, the did that, yeah. So it's, it's going back. So when they leave there, they're u utilizing gender. It's called kaka. In, in the Asante dialect, it's kaka nduru. Nduru is the Asante dialect variant. Ndu is the Aquamu dialect variant. So the word for medicine is ndu. Mm -hmm. In Aquamu, it's nduru in Asante. It's that extra stem. But in our dialect, it's ndu, which we talk about as kudu. So undu means medicine, undu also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession, undu also means to feel a presentiment or foreboding, mm -hmm. divinatory practice, and so forth. And the undu comes from the undua, which is the plant life. So you have undu or the hoodoo coming from the hoodua, which is plant life, mm -hmm. and so forth. So the ginger was called kaka undu, which is kakaru in the Aquamu dialect, kaka unduru or kakaduru. In the Asante dialect, kaka means to bite, to chew. It also means to rub, and it also means to become fierce and irrepressible. Mm -hmm. So we would utilize that on the continent. So when we're forced over here, we see the kakaru over here. They're like, wait a minute, this is something. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you see the same plants, and sometimes mm -hmm. you don't see anything. They're like, we don't know what we see snow and all other kind of stuff. But if we saw a plant that we used to use on the continent, mm -hmm. we saw it here. We would utilize that. So that was the kaka. His name is Inyama. When you look in the Danish records, they would say 
um, the Negroes have a king, Jama. So Yama, sometimes they'll pronounce it Njama or Jama. Mm -hmm. So they'll say the natives call him King Jama because he was an Asafo Hemi. He was a warrior king, a warrior chief. Really a warrior chief. He was a general. Yeah, you know, Ohemi was a real Ohemi. He was a real king. But if you were the head of the warriors, you know, mm -hmm. you're the general. You're the quote unquote warrior mm -hmm. king, mm -hmm. which is like a just a general or admiral mm -hmm. in the United States. So that's why they. That's why his people call him King Jama. But the Danes call him Konge Jomi. So they're like, well, we don't know what Jama is, we just call him John. <laughs> so, so why did you say the Danes? Because are we talking about maybe the Dutch West Indies? Yes, yeah, so they okay. went to St. John's Island. Okay. And they overthrew and took over the, the, the Kwamu, revolted. They took over the whole island for six months. And they were planning to make that the western outpost of the Obama Empire. They were like, well, we got it. We're in control. We overthrew them. We got the plantation owners out of there. So for six months, they were running the whole island. This is like 1733. Um, but eventually, the Europeans got back up and other soldiers from different islands. And even some of the people who were with the Obama on the island but didn't like them, they were like, we're not going to let them Negroes control us. Like, if you were Ebe and didn't like the Obama, mm -hmm. like, we'll rather, rather fight the Europe, with the European against you because you're not going to be our, you know, they had some friction. Mm -hmm. So they ended up ending the revolt. But the top people, including Jama, did not decided to commit suicide because they were like, we're not being taken alive. But he said his spirit would go into that mm -hmm. plant. So he was one who was irrepressible you know, ferocious and so forth. The plant is literally the kaka ndu or kakaru, which is the chewing root. Kaka means rubbing root, makes you fierce and irrepressible. So jama kakaru became, they called him Joni or John. So in English they would say King John. The Danes would say Konge Joni. So it was Joni kakaru. What's so interesting is that in some of the blue songs, it's actually pronounced kakaru. Right, so they'll say, I got that Johnny Kakaru. That's the Akwamu dialect, Chama Kakaru. But if they spoke Asante, they would say Kakaduru or Kakaruru. So sometimes they say Kakaruru, or sometimes they say Kakaru. That's Kakaru or Kakaruru. They have the Asante dialect and the Akwamu dialect, depending on the blues singer. Some say, I got that Johnny Kakaruru. Some say, I got that Johnny Kakaru. We say Chama Kakaru. By John, John Ma Kakaruru. That's the Asante dialectical variant and the Akwam. So, so my question is, how do we, how does that, you know, this may just be like I found numerous high Johns and numerous um, rebel leaders who, the ones I found were executed mm -hmm. and left a bit of their rebel spirit in a plant. This may have been something that happened in more than one place. Well, yeah, because the, the his name, <clears throat> his name in Yama is also the name of a plant totem. So it's like we have animal totems, mineral totems, plant totems, and of course we're the human totems for the deities, but the Inyama plant was connected to the Inyama deity in the Akan tradition. And is that ginger? Is that the ginger one? Well, it, they ended up having to replace the okay, Inyama so plant. What, does, what is the Inyama plant? It's a, there's plant? a certain scientific name. It's, it's in Ghana, though. It's not here. Okay. Um, I may have referenced the science, so-called scientific name in the article, I'll, I'll check. Okay. I think I put it in the article. I'm just wondering because the question that I had to grapple with when I was trying to find High John the Congo, which is why the chapter is called The Search for High John the Congo, mm -hmm. is how that specific, when I was intending to bring you a High John, I okay. kind of went off and left it, but you could come over and get it. Okay. Um, I have a few little High John moves I just given to certain people. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> and the fact that this thing only grows, is only native to, you can plant it in other places, but it's only native to this region in Mexico. Oh, and in the 17th century, there were more African slaves dropped in Mexico than any place else in the New World, including Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, and so at one point, that was the center of the slave trade world. Um, and it grows native there. In abundance, it said. The, the question I had was, how in the world did a root that's native to Mexico become so important to black folks in Tennessee 
right. or in New York or something. So now I've got a whole series of questions about how does that, this, what happens on St. John's Island, how does that figure into uh, this whole, what High John is today? Because that was ginger. Why aren't we carrying ginger root? I mean, what, where is the disconnect? This is my question. What, what is lost? And one of the things I had to figure out, if I was going to say that, that this thing came out of Mexico, because that seemed to be the only place I could find it growing, and all the literature says it's only native to this place. Uh -huh. How does this thing get out of Mexico into the United States? And that's when I began to search for how. And once again, it was given to me, Walter Johnson's book, Soul by Soul, Life Inside the New Orleans Slave Pens. Uh -huh. That's when I figured this thing out, that it was Louisiana is owned by the French. Uh -huh. They lose it to the Spanish. Right. And the Spanish hold it for 39 years uh -huh. before it goes back to the French. In that 39 years, the Spanish change their center of commerce from Seville, Spain to New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh -huh. And they start trading slaves from the entire Spanish world through the slave pens of New Orleans. So Africans from you know, Peru, uh -huh. with the Spanish in Peru, are shipped up into the slave pens of New Orleans. Right. And that's when I said, oh my God, that's how it could have gotten out of Mexico into the black American population. Yeah, and the slave pens during that. Across. So how could this thing have gotten from St. John's Island, which was probably not that difficult to figure out, because people were traded all over the place, all the time. Even, even slaves who were colonized by an enemy, uh, colonial power, were still traded. So um, in those slave pens in, in New Orleans, there were slaves that listed their birthplaces as Peru, Mexico, oh, hell, Cuba. Oh my God, just you know, wherever the Spaniards were, there was somebody in those slave pens in New Orleans that listed their birthplace. And the way I found it is, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, who was Harry Haywood's wife. Harry Haywood was a okay. famous okay. black communist. He married a white woman who was a communist. Mm -hmm. And she just died this past year. In fact, she died in Mexico. Um, yeah, she had put together a 150,000 point database on ancestry and genealogy in Louisiana. Oh, okay. And I couldn't get the database to work on my computer, so I called her. a friend of mine knew her and gave me her phone number. And she said, go to your computer, put it in. And then she said, hit some, some, and she hit some keys. And when I hit these keys, up on the screen popped an entire slave list. Mm -hmm or some a slave manifest of people coming through those New Orleans slave pens. And all I had to do was look for the ones who listed their birthplace in Jalapa, Mexico, mm -hmm. who had been born where Hydron is supposed to have put his spirit into this root called Jalapa. And I said, oh my God, that's how it could have happened. That strain of it, how could it have gotten from St. John's being ginger? And that may very well be the ultimate origin of it, because people did take things and use them and transform them and adapt them to their own needs. And just like the, you know, Obi, Obi Bata, they have okay, yeah, for coconuts. Exactly, for the coconut. Because they didn't have access. But yeah, I can see how the yeah, job group yeah, made it from yeah. Mexico. But there's one, one example we give in the book. Who, 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 who controls St. John's Island? Was it, so it was Dutch? Right. But so St. John's, so you have St. John's, and then a couple of miles away is St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. And St. Thomas was a little bit more developed, but they were trying to develop St. John's at the time. So they would drop the enslaved people off at St. Thomas, and then they would ferry them over mm -hmm. to St. John's. So after this happened, and they had took over the whole, that was the first major revolt before Haiti happened. Because okay. this is 1733. Okay. And they took over the whole island for six months, and they were running it, and just, you know, sent shockwaves throughout. Gotcha. The plantation owners, because <laughs> they started trying to pass a law to say we will not bring anybody enslaved from Yakan states.
because they're too prone to revolt. And they were they almost passed that law like we're not going to the quote unquote Gold Coast to get them Negroes because they're always going to cause a problem. But so they were driving off to St. Thomas, ferry them over to St. John, and try to develop that as a new you know plantation. But about thirty plus years after that happened, and that was a major thing because they took over. Um, one of the residents of St. Thomas, he ended up purchasing his freedom and he left St. Thomas and went to Charleston, South Carolina, and that was Demar Reese. And of course he very <laughs> believable. That's easy to see. So and of course he, you know, he organized the major revolt in South Carolina. So but we use that as an example of somebody who was popular, who left the Caribbean and you know, came into the United States. But then, of course, there were other people who were enslaved and who were forced up here. Exactly. Now that, now that I think about that, a lot of us were traded out of the Caribbean into, the, into North America and back and forth. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered when I was looking at this uh, um, Spanish American thing is mm -hmm. those Spaniards traded slaves all over the Spanish Empire, oh, yeah. even yeah. as far as the Philippines. They even right. sent some Africans to the Philippines. Spanish speaking area. Yeah. Forcing them. And, and everywhere, and they, like I said, take people out of Peru and send them to the slave pits in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and the next thing you know is they're sold into Florida. Right. And then when Florida becomes a state, you know, then that's the end of that story. Right. Um, so I got to think about this thing now. Yeah, but that, that whole notion of there were so many people who, you know, and it's a common thing for either the person who's, you know, the hero, he's the, the leader and so forth, you're not taking me alive, they would either say, my spirit's going to go into my Patrick Clan, the Patrick Clan totem. So if they were from the, uh, say, the Great Twelve Clan in Icon tradition, the Patrick Clan animal totem is Osebo, which is the leopard. So they'll say, my spirit is going to the leopard. So whenever they see a leopard, that spirit would animate that leopard to attack the enemy. But sometimes they would say, well, my spirit's going to go into our plant totem. The divinity who's connected to the plant totem that's associated with our Patrick plant and magic plant. That was a common thing to say, you use this, this root. It's not only going to connect you to the Patrick plant ancestors and ancestors, but I'm about to be one of them. So you can call me through the plant totem. That makes perfect sense. So then, like you said, there'll be a, a, a bunch of warriors in Jamaica and North America, wherever it happens, somebody's going to be the one who got killed. They'll say, if you use this plant that's connected to this magic plant or patrick plant, you can evoke that ancestral spirit quickly. Just like we use a picture, you know, put it on a shrine. We didn't have pictures. <laughs> we couldn't make sculptures at that point. We would take the root that they use. Or just like sometimes now people will take a piece of clothing from somebody mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. We would take the root that was associated with that clan and then we can evoke the ancestral spirits associated with that root. So we'll put in a bunch of people, you know, and get caught. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and wrap it. But we can, we, we can always do a part two. <laughs> we can always do that. I appreciate you for, you know. Well, I appreciate the fact that everything. you asked me. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. So um, we're going to wrap it here. This is uh, the Hoodoo Cast podcast for authentic Kudu, I'm Ojirafo, and check our website for our upcoming podcasts, broadcasts, events. We also have our Patreon community, the Hudu Cast community. You can join that uh, Patreon community and you will see um, all of the information on the website, hudocast.com. We are streaming on all you know, major platforms. So once again, Yerase, we thank you for tuning in with us. And Yebesha Bio, we will meet again. Yerase, we thank you for tuning in to our podcast. See our website at hoodoocast.com to download our 31 books and access our 38 online courses. See our Hoodoocast Patreon community for all exclusive content. And also use our Hoodoocast hashtag on all social media platforms. Yebeshia.